In the annals of law enforcement history, few names evoke as much reverence and mystique as Elliot Ness. Known as an incorruptible crime fighter, Ness's fearless pursuit of justice during Prohibition-era America cemented his legacy as a legendary figure. But between the excitement and attraction of his famous career lies a dark and mysterious chapter, the day this icon and legend died. What secrets lie hidden beneath the surface of Ness's final hours? Was it a tragic accident, the hand of fate, or something more threatening at play? Join us as we delve deep into the shadows of history and uncover the secrets of the day Elliot Ness died. A Chicago Detective's Early Journey Elliot Ness was born on April 19, 1903, in the busy city of Chicago. His mother, Emma, named him after her favorite author, George Eliot, showing her love for literature from the start. Eliot was the youngest in his family, with three older sisters and a brother who were already teenagers when he arrived. His parents, Emma and Ian, had immigrated from Norway and owned a successful bakery in Chicago's South Side, providing well for their family. However, Ian's busy schedule at the bakery often kept him away from home, leaving Elliot primarily raised by his caring sisters and mother. Despite being pampered and perhaps a bit spoiled, Elliot remained a likable and polite child. His mother especially showered him with attention and high expectations. She wanted him to be the best-dressed and top-performing student in the neighborhood. Surrounded by strong female influences from a young age, Elliot developed a lifelong appreciation for the opposite sex. At Pullman Elementary School, Elliot was recognized as shy and often found with his nose buried in a book. He had a genuine passion for reading, consuming classic novels, and even tackling the works of Shakespeare at a young age. However, he particularly enjoyed detective stories, such as those featuring Sherlock Holmes, firing his interest in investigative work from an early age. His sister Clara tied the knot with a young agent from the Justice Department named Alexander Jamie Elliott, and this union opened up a world of excitement for Elliott. He became charmed with his brother-in-law, who was a real-life detective working for the government. Alexander even took Elliot under his wing, teaching him how to shoot at the government's firing range and entertaining him with thrilling tales of his adventures as a federal agent. This was a time of the Great Uprising, with the era of ban threatening and the criminal underworld gaining strength in Chicago. It was a thrilling period to be a federal agent, and Elliot was captivated by the stories and experiences shared by his brother-in-law. Despite being somewhat disorganized and uncomfortable, Elliot managed to maintain a decent appearance, thanks to his mother's efforts. He earned the nickname Elegant Mess due to his somewhat violent nature. His passion for cars was evident in high school, though he remained quiet and reserved. Throughout high school, Elliot worked hard, holding down a paper route and assisting in his father's bakery. His father instilled in him a strong work belief and emphasized the importance of education. Despite not being around much, Elliot's father always encouraged him to excel academically and pursue higher education to secure a good job in the future. In the fall of 1921, Elliot began a new chapter of his life by enrolling at the University of Chicago to study commerce, law, and political science. This marked his first time living away from his parents as he joined the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity. It was at university where Elliot truly began to break out of his shell, becoming quite popular among his peers, particularly with the ladies. With his striking appearance, strong physique, and stylish attire, Elliot caught the attention of many. He also excelled in activities such as jiu-jitsu and tennis, showcasing his athleticism and courage. Upon graduating in 1925 with a degree in business, Elliot had the opportunity to enter Chicago's corporate world. However, he opted for a different path, choosing to work as an investigator for an insurance company while preparing for his civil service test. His ultimate goal, was to become a lawman, drawn to the excitement and challenges of Chicago during the Roaring Twenties. During this time, Chicago was a vibrant but dangerous city, with outlawing in full swing. Despite the ban on alcohol, illegal activities such as drinking, prostitution, and gambling were rampant, with notorious figures like Al Capone reigning supreme. Capone's influence extended to city cops, city hall, and even federal prohibition agents, making him seemingly untouchable. During this unrest, Elliot sought to join the fight against corruption as a law enforcement officer. 
However, he faced significant challenges, as the Prohibition Bureau, tasked with enforcing the law, was rampant with corruption. Underpaid, incompetent, and often on the take, many agents were more of a disadvantage than a help in combating illegal activities. Nevertheless, Elliot remained determined to uphold justice in a lawless city. Elliot Ness takes on Al Capone. Elliot Ness made a bold decision to join the ranks of federal outlawing agents, despite knowing it would disappoint his father and horrify his mother. This choice would prove to be key in his life, shaping his reputation and opening doors to significant opportunities. With his perfect background and influential family connections, Ness quickly rose through the ranks and faced off against none other than Alphonse Capone, the notorious smuggler. In taking on this role, Ness embarked on a hit course with Capone's empire, where thousands of barrels of illegal alcohol flowed into nightclubs and gambling joints every day. While there were occasional crackdowns, they often seemed more for show than effective enforcement. Despite his personal belief that prohibition was misguided, Ness remained dedicated to upholding the law, even though he, like many Americans, indulged in the occasional drink. Throughout his career, Ness navigated the complexities of enforcing a law that went against human nature, as he often put it. Despite his tendencies, he remained steadfast in his commitment to his duties, never publicly questioning the legislation he had sworn to uphold. Even during his college days as a fraternity member, Ness's fondness for a drink was apparent, yet he remained loyal to the law. He strongly disliked the arrogance of Al Capone, a stylishly dressed criminal who openly defied the law. Capone's illegal activities brought in over $100 million a year, mainly from selling smuggled alcohol. He spent vast sums of money bribing ban agents, which embarrassed both Elliot Ness and his superior, United States Attorney George E.Q. Johnson. President Herbert Hoover had ordered Johnson to address Chicago's alcohol problem, but gathering evidence against Capone seemed impossible due to the untrustworthiness of those involved in the investigations. Johnson devised a clever plan to target Capone from multiple angles. The Treasury Department would gather information on Capone's tax evasion, while the Prohibition Bureau would gather evidence of his violations of the prohibiting act. Each investigation was led by a carefully chosen team known for their integrity. When Johnson sought a recommendation for the leader of the Prohibition Squad, he turned to Alexander Jamie Elliott, Ness's brother-in-law. Without hesitation, Jamie suggested Elliot Ness, who, despite being only 26 years old, was known for his honesty and integrity. Johnson hired Ness, and his team set out to disrupt Capone's operations by locating and shutting down his breweries. By cutting off Capone's source of income and his ability to bribe officials, they aimed to weaken his power. Additionally, Johnson hoped these raids would boost public confidence in law enforcement and divert Capone's attention away from evading taxes. Johnson understood that going after the gang's illegal alcohol operations in Chicago would be challenging, but he saw an opportunity to pursue tax evasion charges. While Chicagoans tolerated drinking, they were less forgiving of tax dodging. Johnson knew that targeting Al Capone's smuggling empire would require a clever strategy, so he devised a plan to use the banning squad as a recreation while focusing on the tax case. With great excitement, Johnson assembled a team of nine young men, each possessing unique skills like wiretapping, lockpicking, and tailing suspects. Their sterling status for integrity earned them the nickname The Untouchables. In September of 1929, they embarked on their mission, tracing the path of illegally brewed beer from saloons to breweries. Despite experiencing reinforced doors and fleeing suspects, the Untouchables seized significant smuggling equipment worth nearly a million dollars within their first six months. Though they made no arrests, their relentless pursuit dealt a blow to Capone's organization and demonstrated their determination to uphold the law. Ness wanted to learn more, so he secretly listened in on the phone conversations of Capone's associates, like Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik and Al's older brother Ralph Capone. It was a risky move because Capone had people watching everywhere. Ness kept watch while wiretapping expert Paul Robsky placed listening devices on Ralph Capone's phones. Despite the danger, it paid off as valuable information started pouring in. Ness even transcribed some of the conversations himself. 
The recordings reveal details about where Capone's illegal breweries were located, how much beer they were producing, and where it was being distributed. Armed with this knowledge and a specially modified truck equipped with a snowplow, Ness and his team could bust down the brewery's doors and shut them down. On June 13, 1930, a group of law enforcement officers carried out a raid, arresting six men and seizing two trucks, while also destroying equipment valued at $25,000. This event gained attention in the newspapers, and Elliot Ness, one of the officers involved, kept clippings of the coverage. However, the raid and Ness's involvement may not have been a major concern for the popular gangster Al Capone. Capone likely had more pressing matters on his mind, such as dealing with rival gangsters and ongoing tax issues. Meanwhile, IRS agent Frank Wilson was making progress in uncovering Capone's illegal income by locating secret ledgers. However, to solidify the case, Wilson needed to find the accountant who had written the books. Despite his personal life taking a back seat due to his dedication to the case, Ness found love with Edna Staley, Alexander Jamie's secretary, and proposed to her. Yet they postponed their wedding due to Ness's demanding work schedule. Ness's relentless pursuit of Capone began to make an impact, prompting Capone to attempt bribery by offering $2,000 a week to relax enforcement. However, Ness strongly rejected the bribe, showcasing his incorruptible nature. Despite threats and pressure from Capone's associates, Ness remained loyal to his mission. Ness's actions gathered media attention, describing him as a courageous figure opposing Capone's criminal empire. Behind the scenes, IRS agents were making significant progress in building a case against Capone for tax evasion. Finally, Capone was charged with multiple counts, including smuggling and tax violations in 1931. Despite doubts about the outcome, Ness and his team were determined to bring Capone to justice. George Johnson, a United States attorney, strategically decided to prosecute Al Capone for tax evasion before pursuing charges related to prohibition. During Capone's trial, Elliot Ness, part of the prosecution team, observed the proceedings as a spectator for five weeks. Eventually, the jury found Capone guilty of tax evasion after a brief deliberation, resulting in an 11-year prison sentence. Despite his disappointment at not being directly involved in Capone's conviction, Elliot was credited by his boss, Johnson, in an interview with the Chicago Tribune. Johnson publicly praised the special prohibition squad led by Ness, which became known as the Untouchables due to their refusal to accept bribes. This story gathered widespread attention and established Ness's reputation as the primary figure in Capone's downfall, overshadowing the role of the taxman. Despite the misunderstanding, Ness did not correct it and even capitalized on it when it served his interests. However, this false image haunted Ness throughout his life, overshadowing his numerous accomplishments. Among uncertainty about his professional future, Elliot Ness married his longtime girlfriend, Edna Staley, but their happiness was tempered by the challenges ahead, the trials of Elliot Ness. Despite his fame and accomplishments, Elliot Ness faced numerous challenges and setbacks throughout his career in law enforcement. His tenure, particularly after bringing down Al Capone, was marked by disagreement and obstacles that tested his determination and damaged his public image. One of the main challenges Ness encountered was the unrealistic expectations placed upon him as a crime fighter following the successful conviction of Capone. He was viewed as a symbol of incorruptibility and efficiency, which earned him affection and respect, but also created huge pressure to consistently deliver similar results. This pressure to live up to his legend weighed heavily on Ness, as he was expected to continually produce successful outcomes like the Capone case, which was not always feasible. Despite his best efforts, the burden of meeting these unrealistic expectations often proved hard, leading to further challenges and setbacks in his career. As he advanced in his career, he faced a significant challenge in dealing with the complicated world of politics and bureaucracy within law enforcement. His job required him to carefully balance enforcing the law while managing his relationships with political figures. This often proved difficult, as not everyone shared his strong commitment to honesty and integrity. Ness's dedication to fighting crime sometimes clashed with the more traditional approaches of his colleagues and superiors. Many were not prepared for his unconventional methods 
and refusal to settle on corruption. This resistance within the system frustrated Ness and made it harder for him to implement broader reforms. Additionally, disagreements surrounded some of Ness's tactics in combating crime. While his relentless pursuit of notorious gangster Al Capone made him a hero to many, it also raised questions about the legality and principles of his methods. Overall, he faced numerous challenges in his efforts to uphold the law and bring about positive change in law enforcement, driving a complex landscape filled with political maneuvering and resistance to change. In other contexts, his tactics often sparked disagreement and divided opinions. For instance, his bold and aggressive raids, coupled with his unwavering approach to law enforcement, sometimes brought accusations of excessive force and crimes against civil rights. These criticisms not only tarnished his professional reputation, but also ignited debates about the delicate balance between maintaining effective law enforcement and safeguarding civil freedoms. Beyond his professional endeavors, his personal life was also the subject of intense public attention. Despite his high-profile career, his relationship slipped under the strain of constant attention and the pressures of his job. He endured three marriages, each of which became fodder for gossip and speculation, adding to the weight on his shoulders. Furthermore, his struggle with alcoholism was a closely watched battle that played out in the public eye over the years. His demons not only affected his well-being, but also cast doubt on his ability to perform his duties effectively. As he advanced in his career, particularly during his tenure as safety director of Cleveland, Ohio, he faced perhaps his most daunting challenge yet, reforming a deeply rooted culture of corruption within the police department. This huge task required him to make tough decisions, including dismissing officers and implementing sweeping policy changes. However, these bold actions also earned him enemies within the law enforcement community, further separating him and complicating his efforts to bring about meaningful change. The Troubled Life and Career of Ness Ness faced a series of personal and professional challenges that marked the last part of his life. His fall from grace was just as remarkable as his rise to fame. As his career progressed, his personal life started to unravel, especially due to his battle with alcoholism, which began to have a significant impact on his work and reputation. The stress of his high-profile job, combined with the pressure to maintain his untouchable image, drove him towards alcohol as a way to cope. This reliance on alcohol not only strained his relationships, but also confused his judgment and decision-making abilities, leading to professional mistakes that would have been unimaginable in his earlier years. Ness's marital life was also unsettled, as he was married three times, with each marriage struggling under the weight of his career demands and personal struggles. His first two marriages ended in divorce, and although his third marriage to Betty Anderson in 1938 seemed to offer some stability, it too was affected by the challenges of his lifestyle. The constant attention and gossip surrounding his life only added to the stress and further damaged his public image. In his quest for justice, he faced numerous obstacles that tested his resolve and determination. Despite his earlier triumphs in Chicago, where he had earned accolades for his outstanding work, his transition to Cleveland proved to be fraught with challenges. Upon assuming the role of safety director, he embarked on a mission to rebuild the city's corrupt police force. Armed with a brutal determination to root out corruption, he implemented bold reforms and cracked down on misconduct within the department. However, his no-nonsense approach often shook feathers and drew the anger of those resistant to change. Despite facing opposition at every turn, he pressed forward, undeterred by the daunting task before him. Yet his relentless pursuit of justice would ultimately lead him down a path fraught with threats. The Torso Murders, a string of gruesome killings that terrorized the city, presented him with his greatest challenge yet. The sharp nature of the serial killer, who operated with chilling precision, frustrated investigators at every turn. Despite pouring countless resources into the investigation and employing innovative tactics, the perpetrator remained one step ahead, leaving a path of injured victims in his wake. As the pressure mounted and public outcry grew, he found himself holding with the weight of expectations bearing down upon him. Each setback served as a harsh reminder of the stakes at hand, heightening the attention he faced from both the public and his peers. Haunted by the vision of his unresolved cases, 
He wrestled with the demons that threatened to consume him. The torso murders in particular would leave an indelible mark on his mind, serving as a constant reminder of the lives lost and the justice denied. Despite his best efforts, the case would remain a haunting mystery, casting a long shadow over his career and serving as proof of the unforgiving nature of the criminal underworld. Yet, between the darkness, he remained resolute in his pursuit of truth, determined to bring closure to those who had been denied justice. He also experienced financial difficulties due to his extravagant lifestyle and poor money management, which resulted in significant debt. This financial burden was worsened by his struggle to secure stable employment after leaving his role as safety director. Despite trying to capitalize on his fame through various business ventures and political ambitions, such as an unsuccessful mayoral run in 1947, his fortunes continued to decline. In his final years, he gradually retreated from public view, with his once famous career in law enforcement fading into the background. Instead of notable achievements, he found himself in a series of mundane jobs, including a brief stint with the federal government in Washington and the District of Columbia, and later as president of the Diebold Safe Company in Ohio. However, none of these positions provided the same sense of purpose and satisfaction he had experienced in his law enforcement career. The Struggles and Fallen of Hero Since his failed mayoral campaign, he had been struggling to make ends meet, desperately seeking a breakthrough that would bring financial stability and thrust him back into the limelight. He landed a job at a startup called Guarantee Paper Corporation, tasked with promoting their innovative check watermarking technology to prevent fraud. The company was banking on its former reputation as a crime fighter to attract investors. At 54 years old, he relocated with his family to the company's headquarters in a rural Pennsylvania town, far removed from the busy city life he once knew. The locals were unaware of his achievements and were more familiar with historical figures like Al Capone than with Ness. Despite his prestigious former status, he drove a worn-out convertible from the 1950s, sparking belief among observers. However, his new role quickly revealed the weak foundation of guarantee paper. With minimal capital and lackluster prospects, the company struggled to gain traction. While he tried to promote the product, he could not match his past strength and dedication. Instead, he often retreated to the local bar after work, succumbing to his alcoholism, a habit that had become all too familiar to those around him. The excessive drinking was affecting him, both physically and financially, especially since he wanted to support his wife and son despite the company's struggles. However, he found some comfort in the supportive community he found at work, believing it to be a good environment for his 10-year-old son, Bobby. As the family started attending the local Presbyterian church, they hoped for some solace. But one Sunday, he was overcome with chest pains and had to seek medical help for his nerves and anxiety. The doctor prescribed him sedatives, a common treatment at the time. During a business trip to New York, he met a sports writer named Oscar Fraley, who was intrigued by Elliot's stories about his past encounters with criminals like Al Capone. Fraley suggested that Elliot should write a book about his experiences, potentially making some money from it. This suggestion was just what Elliot needed to kickstart his writing journey. 25 years later, after many ups and downs, Elliot finally finished his manuscript and sent it to Fraley. However, Fraley's version of the story was quite different from Elliot's original, focusing more on sensationalism and excitement. Fraley wrote about how it was the untouchables, especially, who played a key role in bringing down Capone by gathering the evidence that led to his conviction for tax evasion. Ness would share his draft with friends, sometimes embellishing the story to make it more interesting. Ness, on the other hand, was struggling financially and compromised his honesty by overstating his role in the story to sell more books and support his family. Fraley, though not known for his journalistic skills, helped get the book published through his connections. When Ness learned that the book would be accepted for publication, he excitedly shared the news with everyone, hoping it would bring some financial relief. Just two months later, on May 16, 1957, something tragic happened to Elliot. After reviewing some final proofs of his book at the office, he left work around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. As he walked home, he suddenly felt chest pain and had trouble breathing. 
When he reached his kitchen and tried to get a glass of water, he collapsed. Fortunately, his wife Betty, who had been working in the garden, heard the noise and rushed in. Sadly, Elliot had suffered a massive heart attack and passed away. Elliot had left instructions to be burned up, and he wanted his ashes scattered over water. However, there was a problem. There wasn't enough money to cover the expenses. Elliot had died deeply in debt, owing creditors over $7,000. He had a car and uncashed paychecks from the paper company in his wallet, but it wasn't enough to make ends meet. Despite receiving only a $200 advance for his book, The Untouchables, Elliot ended up with very little money in the end. The Cultural Icon's Legacy Elliot Ness left behind a rich and detailed legacy that goes beyond just his accomplishments. He was more than just a crime fighter. He became deeply woven into the fabric of American culture and identity. His greatest contribution was his relentless dedication to upholding law and order during a time when corruption and organized crime threatened to tear society apart. Ness's efforts in taking on the mob, particularly his role in bringing down Al Capone, became the stuff of legend. His triumph over seemingly impossible odds established his reputation as a symbol of incorruptibility and justice. Working with his team, the Untouchables, he set a new standard for law enforcement, showing the importance of integrity and determination in the face of widespread corruption. Ness's impact extended far beyond his time, continuing to influence culture through books, films, and television shows that illustrate his life and career. Each interpretation adds to the mythology surrounding him, ensuring that his legacy endures for generations to come. The Western Reserve Historical Society has a collection of documents related to Elliot Ness, a famous figure known for his work in Chicago during the 1920s and 1930s. Among these documents are a scrapbook covering the years 1928 to 1936, newspaper clippings from 1935 to 1950, and a typed manuscript detailing Ness's career in Chicago. Additionally, there are various other papers, including a report on a company called Fidelity Check Corporation and Garanti Paper, where Ness served as president. Elliot Ness's life has inspired numerous media works, including books and movies. One of the most notable works is The Untouchables, a book co-authored by Ness and Oscar Fraley, which was published posthumously and became a bestseller selling 1,500,000 copies. While some have questioned the accuracy of the book, later research suggests that it provides a generally accurate portrayal of Ness's life and work. A 21-page manuscript written by Ness for the book is preserved in the archives of the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland, Ohio. The story of Elliot Ness has been brought to life in various forms of entertainment, sparking creativity and inspiring new works. One of the most famous adaptations is the 1959 TV series called The Untouchables, where Robert Stack portrayed Ness and Walter Winchell provided the narration. Another notable adaptation is the 1987 film directed by Brian De Palma, simply titled The Untouchables, featuring Kevin Costner as Ness, Sean Connery, and Robert De Niro. These interpretations, though fabricated, have led to the creation of numerous novels TV movies, and even stage plays. For example, there was a TV movie called The Return of Elliot Ness, which saw Stack reprising his role. Additionally, a short-lived 1993 TV series titled The Untouchables starred Tom Amandez as Ness and William Forsyth as Capone. Ness's character has also made appearances in other mediums, such as comic books like Torso and the HBO television series Boardwalk Empire, where actor Jim True Frost portrayed him. Moreover, author Max Allen Collins incorporated Ness as a character in his historical private eye novels featuring Chicago detective Nate Heller. Collins later gave Ness his series, set during his time as Cleveland's public safety director. The first book, titled The Dark City, delves into Ness's efforts to clean up a corrupt police force, while the second book, Butcher's Dozen, follows his pursuit of a notorious serial killer. In Bulletproof, Ness faces off against labor racketeers attempting to control Cleveland's food service industry. Overall, Elliot Ness's legacy continues to captivate audiences across various forms of media, providing endless inspiration for new stories and interpretations. 
Elliot Ness is a popular figure in hip-hop and rap music, with many artists mentioning him in their songs, like in California Love. In the movie Murder by the Numbers from 1993, Ness is shown investigating illegal gambling in Cleveland. These stories are fabricated but are inspired by real cases solved by Ness and the Cleveland police. Author Max Allen Collins even wrote a play called Elliot Ness, An Untouchable Life, which got nominated for an award. Ness also appears in Collins's graphic novel Road to Perdition. Recently, Collins teamed up with historian author Brad Schwartz to write a biography called Scarface and the Untouchable, focusing on Ness's battles with Al Capone in Chicago. They're now working on a second book about Ness's time in Cleveland. In the TV show, The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, actor Frederick Weller plays a young Elliot Ness, who is depicted as Indiana Jones's college roommate. Even in video games, Ness is celebrated. The Untouchables was released in 1989 for various gaming platforms, allowing players to experience his adventures. Plus, the Great Lakes Brewing Company in Cleveland honors Ness with their Elliot Ness Amber Lager, which pays tribute to his legacy through its name, description, and label art. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.